Father, we thank you today. We bless your name. How good and glorious you are. We're asking, Lord, at this moment, you speak to every heart in Jesus' name. Uh, there will be no blockade, there will be no wall of demarcation between us and you. But there will be a direct flow of your word, of your mind, of your power unto everyone. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Look for Amen. God bless you. You can sit down. We're coming to the final message in our series as we're talking about the growth and the impact in ministry. And this morning, we're talking about greater growth through the grace and the gifts of the Spirit. We're talking about salvation. We're talking about steadfastness. We're talking about spirituality. We're talking about the salvation of God. The salvation that comes by the grace of God. We're talking about steadfastness in the godliness that that grace brings to our lives. We're talking about the spirituality that makes us grow and grow and grow in life, in ministry, in achievement. Acts chapter 4 verse 33. It says, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great, 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 great grace was upon them all. Great grace, not only on one apostle. Great grace was upon them all. Some people say, well, thank God for the great grace in our pastor. In our senior pastor. In our overseer. But did you forget that the great grace should be upon us all? The grace to preach, the grace to pray, the grace to endure persecution, the grace to go everywhere, the grace to obey the Lord upon them all, upon us all, great grace. Amen. Those are the people that say, I am not satisfied to be at this level. I want to go as high as I can be. So that there will be great power. There will be great grace upon us all. Look at chapter 9, verse 31. In chapter 9, verse 31, it says, and then add the church's rest. The church's add rest. Uh, when the Bible, the New Testament in particular, talks about rest, it's not talking about sleeping. It's not talking about tranquility. That is, there is no wind, there is no storm, there is nothing. We're just there. There remains a rest for the people of God. We rest from struggling. We rest from fighting. We rest from struggling against Satan, against sin, against self. We rest. 
It's talking about restoration. Talking about redemption. Talking about the peace we have with God and the peace we have with one another. The church is at rest. They were not agitated or in conflict. Rest and peace in our soul. Rest and peace between one another. Rest and peace between that branch and this branch. Rest and unity. When we're totally restored. When the redemption of the Lord is present and prevalent in the church. Then at the church's rest throughout all Judea. And Galilee and uh, Samaria. And uh, they were edified. When uh, we are resting, we have the rest of the Lord in us. There is edification. How you stand will edify me. How you look will edify me. Your posture, your position, and the peace we have, and the interaction we have, will edify other people. It's not just that you do your thing, whether we are edified or not. <clears throat> and walking in the fear of the Lord. New Testament. Some people think Old Testament, fear of the Lord. But they think in the New Testament, there's no fear of the Lord. You understand what he's talking about? The filial fear, the family fear. When you love the Lord and you fear the Lord, you will not want to do anything that he does not appreciate. You are conscious of the presence of God every time. You are conscious of the precept of the Lord at every, every time. You are conscious of the purpose of the Lord in the meeting you have every time. You are walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost. They were multiplied. Multiplied. You see, the church will grow. When we grow, when ministers, apostles, and preachers, and bishops, when we grow, the church will multiply. Your church will multiply. Your ministry will multiply. The goodness of God and the flow of the power of the Lord in your ministry will grow and multiply in Jesus' name. We're talking about greater growth. Through the grace and the gifts of the Spirit. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, the commission and purpose of the gospel of the Savior. The gospel of the Savior. The purpose of that gospel. The commission of that gospel. Number two, the consecration of partakers of the grace of sanctification. Grace has not done its complete work in your life if there is no sanctification. Grace has not gone far enough in your life if there's no sanctification. Grace still wants to do more. That's why we're talking about growth. If only have salvation, salvation, salvation. We're not moving forward. There's no growth. It's only talking about forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. And there's no freedom. You've not got enough of the grace of God. 
if we only talk about the first experience we at salvation and we have not gone deep or deeper into holiness, grace has not done enough. If you are deep, but you are not deeper. If you are deeper, but you are not deepest. If you are high, but you are not higher. If you are higher, but you are not highest. If the grace of God has not gone to every corner, nook and corner of your heart, cleansed you, and he has totally brushed everything away from your life that should not be there, you have not got enough grace, we're moving forward this morning. Some people think sanctification is only for a denomination. No. It's from God. And Sammy. And it's for you. And I, by the grace of God, I have looked at sanctification and holiness in that Bible. I have preached it outside the Deep and Life Bible Church. I'm invited everywhere. I go to different denominations. I've been in America and another church, not our own Deep and Life Bible Church. And I've emphasized holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. I've emphasized this is the will of God, even your sanctification. And I've preached that in different churches in Nigeria, different churches in Africa, different churches in America, and different churches in Europe. I have emphasize that this is what the Bible says, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. And I preached it when I'm glad. I preach it when I'm sad. I preach it when I'm full. I preach it when I'm hungry. Sanctification does not depend on how I feel. Now I feel good, I'm going to preach holiness. No wonder I feel good. Or even when I'm under persecution, I preach sanctification. The consecration of partakers of the grace of sanctification. Number three, the comprehension and the possession of the gifts of the Spirit. We, we need the gifts of the Spirit so that what we are doing, we are not doing in the energy of the flesh. We are doing it in the power, in the possession of the gifts of the Spirit. Look at these things one by one. Number one, the commission and the purpose of the grace of salvation. Of the grace of the Savior. Matthew chapter 28 verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Christ is our Savior. Christ is sovereign. Christ is all in all. And now before he gives the church the great commission, he announces he has all power, all authority in heaven and on earth. Before he gives us the commission, he says you are not going to look at any other authority. You are not going to obey to any other authority. You are not going to submit to any other authority. All power, all authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. 
pas regarder ou vous soumettre ou fléchir devant une autre autorité, tout pouvoir m'a été donné dans les cieux sur la terre. As we take the gospel, as we spread the gospel, we do not recognize any other power. We do not recognize any other authority. We recognize neither the face nor the frown of any man. All power, all authority is given unto the sovereign Christ in heaven and on earth. Then in verse 19, it said, Go ye therefore. Because you are in submission to my authority, go ye therefore. Because nothing in the sky, nothing in the sea, and nothing on earth, on the ground, can hinder you because I have all power and authority. Go ye therefore. You are not looking here and there who is behind me, who supports me, who encourages me. Said, no, don't look at them. Look at the sovereign Christ that has all power, all authority on earth and in heaven. Go ye therefore. And he says, and teach all nations. The curriculum is the same. The teaching is the same. All nations, whatever the nation, you are preparing them for heaven. And it's the same qualification that will get everybody in any nation to heaven. That's why we don't change the prism and the preaching from nation to nation. Because the same qualification, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And if you want the people you are preaching to in any nation to get to the kingdom of God, ye must be born again. Il a donné une seule qualification, vous devez naître de nouveau. Donc, si vous voulez que les gens qui vous suivent n'importe où, dans toute nation, aillent au ciel, vous devez naître de nouveau. Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Faites de toutes les nations des disciples, baptisant au nom du Père, du Fils et du Saint-Esprit. In verse 20, teaching them. You have taught them about salvation. They have repented. They have believed on the Lord. They have entered into the kingdom. After entering the kingdom, teaching them to observe. Not just teaching them to learn. They must live by what they learn. Teaching them to do. Teaching them to observe. All things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you. Hold on. Teach them to observe. If you do that, I am with you. If you abandon what he has commanded, and you are preaching and teaching what his enemy, the devil, puts in your mouth, the Lord will not give you the tool to oppose him, to preach against him. The Lord will not give you the tool to preach for Satan. The promise of being with you always is grounded on the basis that we are teaching them everywhere you go, whatsoever I have commanded you. Because now you want the presence of the Lord with you all the time. The power of the Lord with you all the time. And you want the anointing of the Lord to be with you all the time. You're teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. 
Then I am with you always, even to the end of the world. And everybody said, yeah. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 26. We're reading from verse 16. It said, But rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. Always remember that. Why has God called me? For what purpose has he raised me up? I think of that all the time. I'm going to a new country. And they are, you know, they, they are happy and they give flowers and everything. And, uh, you know, they want me to talk to them. For what purpose am I there? Any country, every country. Is it to make the sinners happy in their sin? To make the backsliders love me? If I'm looking for the love of the backsliders, I'm out of ministry. You are there for a purpose. I am there for a purpose to turn sinners from their sin. To pinch the backslider, prick the backslider until with conviction he falls down and calls upon the name of the Lord and returns to the Lord. That is why I'm here. That is why we are there in ministry. For this purpose have I appeared unto thee, to make thee a minister, a witness, both of the things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. Can you see two parts of uh, the purpose of God? The things which you have seen. The things which you know already. But that's not enough. And the things in the which I will appear unto you. Some people say, yes, I come to the minister's conference. And they want us to only emphasize what they have known before. And whatever they have not known, they say, no, I'm too old now in the ministry to add anything to what I've known. What I've known, full stop. The purpose why you are here is to remind you of what you have seen already. And then not only to remind you, to reveal the things in the which it will appear unto you. In verse 17, it says, Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. Look at verse 18. It says to open their eyes. That's why we preach. That's why we teach. That's why we reveal the word of God, the mind of God. To open their eyes. To turn them from darkness to light. If our message does not turn anyone from the past to, you know, the, the purity of the Lord, we're not fulfilling the purpose of God. If we're not turning those in darkness to the light of the gospel, we have not done the thing we are appointed for. If we're not turning people from vacillation to steadfastness, we have not done what the Lord has called us to do. To turn them from the power of Satan unto God. That they may receive forgiveness of sin. And uh, also inheritance among them uh, which are sanctified by faith that's in Christ. 
the commission and the purpose of the gospel of the Savior. Uh, look at three things here. Number one is great grace and full and faithfulness for the great commission. Number two, the glorious gospel in fullness through the great commitment. Number three is the greater going forth with great faith for the great conversions. Uh, look at number one there. Number one is great grace and faithfulness for the great commission. Uh, the grace of God saves us. And that same grace of God makes us faithful. Without grace, you cannot be saved. Without grace, you cannot manifest that faith. And without grace, you cannot be faithful. There's faith for salvation. There's faith for steadfastness. There's faith for spirituality. There is faith for standing firm. There is faith for serving the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. There is faith for not wavering, not vacillating. And what you want from the Lord is to have so much grace and so much faith that you remain steadfast in the salvation of the Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. For by the grace of God, I am what I am. Tell me, Paul, what do you mean? I am what I am. And some people say, I am what I am. I listen to nobody. I am what I am. I bend for nobody. I am, I am what I am. Is still the old soul. I am what I am. It's deep in sin. I am what I am. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Don't talk to me. Don't try to change me. I know myself. I am what I am. We don't need grace to be what we were in the past. We don't need grace to be disobedient. We don't need grace to be rebellious. We don't need grace to manifest the works of the flesh. If you have been an adulterer before, you don't need grace to remain an adulterer. You're just an adulterer. If you have been a fornicator before, you don't need grace to remain in fornication. We don't need grace for the works of the flesh. We need grace to become a new man, a new woman, a different person. If you have been a persecutor before, and you cannot say, by the grace of God, I am what I am, if you are still persecuting. It is when the new life has come, you can say, were it not for the grace of God, I will still have been a persecutor. If you are an injurious person, injuring people, tormenting people, hurting people. And that is what you have been. You cannot say I am what I am because if the grace of God has come in my, you don't need grace to keep on tormenting people. It is when the grace of God has come in your life and there is a transformation you can say by the grace of God I am now what I am. In the grace of God that makes us new creatures in Christ. In the grace of God that turns our lives around. In the grace of God that makes us kind and loving and gentle when we were 
hurting people in the past. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. A preacher. A preacher of righteousness. A person that is going forth and going forth and preaching the gospel, the gospel of grace, the gospel of godliness, and the gospel of God. It's when that change has come upon your life. When the truth has transformed your life. When the old nature is gone. When the old rebellion is gone. When the old sinfulness is gone. And now you are saved. You are holy. You are pure. Even your thoughts and your mind and your purpose, everything pure before the Lord. That's when you can say, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed on me was not in vain. The grace which was bestowed on me was not in vain. You know, when you have a chance to hear the word of God pure and simple, there's the grace of God. There are other people who are not hearing. If you have the grace that God gives you opportunity to hear and hear and hear, can you say that grace is not in vain? Look at all that we have heard since we started on Friday morning. And yesterday. And all we are hearing today is the grace of God. Other people that do not have that grace, they are not here. If you are here and you have heard and heard and heard, has the grace of God become vain in your life? What change has that grace done? That privilege you have, what change has it made? It says, the grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labor more abundantly than they all. Yet not I. But the grace of God which was with me. That's the grace that makes us to pursue the great commission. I'm looking at number two there. Number two, we're talking about the glorious gospel in fullness through the great, through great commitment. What gospel have I received? Is it in fullness? Does it have salvation? Does it have sanctification? Does it have steadfastness? Does it have everything that Calvary has provided? What grace do you possess? And what commission gospel do you have? Is it in fullness? Does it fill your heart? Does it fill your mind? Does it fill your brain? Does it help you in walking according to that gospel? The gospel that you possess. The gospel that you preach. Is it glorious? Does it make your life glorious? Do people who are near to you, do they say, look at this man, look at this woman, the life is glorious. Do people want to come and check up from you? This man, this woman that never gets angry, this person that never hurts anyone, this one that is always happy because of the joy of heaven in his heart, how is his life this glorious? And please remember, the Lord is wanting to raise up a glorious church that will go at the time of the rapture. 
And if you are preaching that glorious gospel, you must possess the glorious gospel. Your life must reflect the glorious gospel in fullness. In fullness. When you fill up a bottle with water, full, and you put it on the dining table, and you go out, and you come back, that bottle is still full of the water. When you bring a believer and you put within him the glorious gospel and you put him on the table for the world to see, you go, you come back. The believer, like the bottle, is full of the glorious gospel. It's not changing of the weather. It's not changing of the climate. It's not changing of different situations. The glorious gospel in fullness. Through great commitment. As we look at Romans chapter 15, verse 29, it says, I am sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. He spoke to us yesterday. I'm talking about that preacher. And he was full of the glorious gospel. There's the glory of God in his life. But now this morning he comes. He's been fighting at night with his wife. And he's been threatening they will kill you. If you don't, if you're not, I'll kill you. Preacher. And now he comes this morning. The killer cannot preach the glorious gospel. You have to remain in the fruit of the Spirit. The life turned around. Your life living for the glory of God. But you know preachers, preachers who drink alcohol, preachers who smoke tobacco, Preachers so defile, allow me to preach, please. I don't want any shouting when I'm preaching. Let the word sink into you. I'm talking about something serious and somebody there is, you know. Uh, when I hit your sin, just repent before the Lord. Don't shout me down. Hey, there are people they defiling their maid at home and they come to preach. I'm preaching, I'm preaching. There's no use for that kind of preaching. There are people who are stealing money. There are people who are worshiping idols in the secret. You cannot preach the life transforming gospel if you are not living straight, if you are not walking straight. Paul the Apostle said, I am sure because there's no secret sin. I am sure because I carry, I possess, I live by the glorious gospel. I am sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. The Lord do it in every life. Amen. Look at number three here. Number three is greater going forth with great faith for the great conversions. We're going forth because we want souls to be converted. Because that's what Jesus wants. He wants lives turned around. He wants life changed. 
He wants conversion in the heart and the mind in the direction in which we're going. You know, some people just preach. They preach to make people hilarious and happy. And some people just sing. I was talking on Friday. And I was saying that, you know, when you hear a serious message that pricks you, that kind of uh, penetrates your heart, and you're sorrowful, and you want to repent with sorrow for sin, for what you've done in the past, and then somebody comes in, uh, maybe to lead prayer, and he doesn't like how the people are unhappy, how the people are sorrowful, how the people have been kind of punched with the word of God, and then he makes, he wants to make them happy, and begins to sing and sing, uh, and the people forget everything they have had, because now we make everybody happy in their sin. That's not serving the Lord. The people have heard that if they continue that way, they will finish up in hell. They're pricked in their hearts. Some of them are crying. They fall on their faces. They want to repent. And somebody comes and says, Everybody be cheerful. <laughs> no, sir. We cannot be cheerful when we find ourselves in sin. We're going to rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice. Nineveh, if Nineveh did like that, they would have perished. Jonah went a day's journey and he said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. If a Philippians 4 4 comes in, and it says, the word of God says, Nineveh, rejoice always. I say unto you, rejoice. They will wipe all those ashes away. They'll get back on their throne, get back to their drunkenness. Because the preacher, the prayer person says, rejoice, don't be sorrowful. They cannot repent. Remember the message God gave us yesterday? Abandon not the spirit. Blaspheme not the spirit. Contradict not the spirit. If the spirit is leading us towards repentance and you come in to lead prayer or to do anything, contradict not the spirit. And so, when we talk about going forth, we're talking about going forth in the power and the preaching of the gospel. In Mark chapter 16, verse 20, and they went forth. That they're going forth. And they went forth. He had given them the word of repentance. He had given them the word of reconciliation with God. He had given them the word that they should turn away from darkness and come into the light. He said, go teach them. Go tell them. Go spread the news. You are bad, but Christ can make you good. And they went forth with that life-transforming gospel. And they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord walking with them. Hold on. The sin of the sinner crucified Christ on the cross. 
if you encourage the people to continue in the sin that crucified Christ on the cross, the Lord will not walk with you. The reason why God walks with us is because we're on the Lord's side and we say sin of any shape or shape is hateful unto God. So the gospel has turned repent, change, and you turn away from sin and you cry because your sin crucified Christ on the cross. It's when the Lord, then the Lord will look at you and say, I will walk with this preacher. Because he says what God once said. Because he goes in the direction God wants him to go. Because he's turning the people from darkness to light, the light of the world. That's why he walks with the preacher. But the preacher is a drunkard who encourages drunkenness. The preacher who says, uh, you know, those who are listening, we cannot be free from sin. And he says, see himself, preacher, is still sinning every time and encourages the people keep on sinning. Only be sure you are asking God, forgive me. God, forgive me. God will not walk with him. But the people who go out of the transforming gospel of Christ, calling people to repentance, that they will lean on Christ the Savior, the Lord walking with them and confirming the word and confirming the word. Let's say, for example, I told you something. And then you go out. And I happen to be there with you. And you say exactly the opposite of what I told you. And then you look at me. Papa, confirm the word now. I say, no. You disgrace me in the public. You want me to confirm the opposite of what I told you. Who do you think I am? To be happy? To confirm the lie you tell after I told you the truth? Even me, a human being, will not do that. And God will not confirm the lie you tell against Calvary. The lie you preach against Christ. The lie you preach against the eternal truth of God. He only confirms the word if that is his word. He confirms his word. Tell it as it is. Don't add anything. Don't subtract anything. Confirming the word for signs following. And, and everybody said. Yeah. I'm coming to point number two. Point number two. The consecration of partakers of the grace of sanctification. It, it gives us sanctification. The same God of salvation is the God of sanctification. The same God of healing is the same God of holiness. The same God of pardon is the God of purity. And he calls us to sanctification. He gives us the grace for sanctification. He makes us partakers of sanctification. 
and we commit ourselves to that. We consecrate ourselves to that. We abandon ourselves to that. All to Jesus I surrender. All, all, all to Jesus I surrender. My heart, my life, my ways, my purpose, my decision, my aspiration, all to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give, all to him I fully give. I will ever love and trust him. It is in his way, his purpose, his plan. I will ever forever live. That's the consecration is giving, is telling us to make. Simon, Simon, do you love me more than this? That's the consecration he wants to see. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Love that can be demonstrated. Love that's an example to other people. Now, Simon, when you say, I go a fishing, and all the other people followed after you, is that the consecration you have for me? Lovest thou me? Before we partake of that sanctification experience, there must be consecration. While we're expecting that sanctification, there must be consecration. And after possessing, after having, after partaking of the sanctification, we must still have consecration. Uh, look at three things here. Number one is the command by God for sanctification. Number two is the consecration for the grace of sanctification. Number three is the confirmation of our godliness and sanctification. Look at number one. Number one, the command by God to sanctification. In Leviticus chapter 20, reading from verse 7, sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy. Why? For I am the Lord your God. In verse 8, it says, and ye shall keep my statutes. And do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. In verse 7, it says, Sanctify yourself. Separate yourself from every appearance of evil. Prepare yourself for the heavenly sanctification. For I am the Lord that sanctify you. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14. It says, follow peace with all men. I think we need to understand that. Follow peace with all men. Like Jesus. But you must remember that Jesus did not follow peace with the Pharisees. He looked at them. He said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. Because they were hypocrites. It wasn't okay to be at peace with a Pharisee. You have to drop salvation by grace and go for salvation by tradition. Follow peace with all men. Not with Judas Iscariot. Judas, you have a plan, you have a purpose. And it were better a man like that were not born. 
Oh, you cannot follow peace, but you know, those who spoil the gospel, those who contradict the gospel, those who bury the gospel, those who make the word of God ineffective in the lives of people, will follow peace, the normal peace, with all men, normal men, rich men, but not with the people that want to destroy the gospel. For the apostle said, at Ephesus, I confronted all those beasts. They came in and they wanted to look at our liberty, our freedom, and our salvation. They wanted to twist everything. We gave them no chance. No, not for an hour. So, don't you misunderstand, follow peace with all men. They crucify Jesus again, follow peace with all men. They hinder sinners from getting saved, follow peace with all men. It's not talking about compromise. It's not talking about the fear of the people that cannot confront the sin of the sinners. Uh, somebody was asking a question on Saturday. If I want to serve the Lord and I want to go to church and to hear the word of God, I'm born again. I've given my life to the Lord and my husband because she got married before she was born again. And my husband said, no, you will not go anywhere. You will not go to a gospel church. What should I do? Should I just submit to him and deny Christ? Should I submit to him and not go the way of the Lord? And, you know, an answer was given to her. And that, you know, she, she has to be nice. It's good to be nice, but answer my question. Do I stop going to church because that unbelieving man, my husband, says I must not go answer the question? The answer is love Christ above your husband. Love Christ above that backslider. You're not going to sit at home. My husband says I should not go to church. You're yielding to persecution if you stay there. Cook his food, wash his clothes, take care of the children, go to church. Read your Bible. Don't allow anybody to say, follow peace with that man. So that both of you will go to hell. I never be at peace with anybody that will drag me to hell. But I'm going to heaven. Somebody there, I'm going to heaven. And you are going along with me. We're at peace together. You know, as I, I've been coming to Cameroon, why do I want to keep coming? Why? Why? Pourquoi you bien, et bien encore? Why? Because I have people that say, Pastor, what you preach, we accept. Everything you say, that is what we accept. And I don't mind to come next month. Because, because we are together. Follow peace with all men. And holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Holiness. Holiness. Without which no man shall see the Lord. You will be holy. 
That's why I love you. If Lagos is not careful, I'll come and stay here with you. We're looking at number two. Number two now. Number two is the consecration for the grace of sanctification. Uh, the consecration. That we totally abandon ourselves in the hand of the Lord. And we say, I will never leave him. I will never forsake him. I love him. And I'm going to love him above everything on earth. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. Matthew 10, verse 37. In Matthew 10, verse 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. It's not worthy of the Savior. It's not worthy of his salvation. It's not worthy of the sanctifier. It's not worthy of his sanctification. Consecration means that you look around and everything around you, you love Christ more than that. Our wives may not like this, but we have to love Christ above our wives. Our husbands may not like this, and they may not like me. Pastor, preacher, why did you tell my wife to love Christ above me, the husband? Because you cannot save her. Because you cannot take her to heaven. And heaven is greater than earth. And she must love Christ. That can take her to heaven. Above somebody who cannot take her to heaven. The money you give her. Will not take her to heaven. The food you feed her with will not take her to heaven. The nice clothes you buy for her will not take her to heaven. Only one name that can take her from her to heaven. Tell me the name. That's why, that's why your wife must love Christ more than you. We must love Christ above Anyone and everyone. And we demonstrate that. When you go in the direction of the grace of God. And anybody frowns at you. It's a test to know whether you love God more than that person. If you cringe. If you compromise. If you collapse. You show that you love that person, you fear that person more than God. There's no consecration there. The consecration is that you look at the whole earth and you love God, you love Christ more than everyone, everything here on earth. And he that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. You know, um, you know, in our culture, in the French countries, our children recognize any time we sit on the table, there's food there, there's vegetable, there's everything. There must be wine there as well. And you say, now I am born again. Alcohol. Strong drink. 
not on the table anymore. And the children said, Mommy, we are forgetting something. Where is the strong drink? At their young age. Where is the beer? At their young age. And you see, children, Papa is born again now. Mama is born again now. Father, I'll call. No more alcohol. Papa, what kind of church is that? It's not church, it's Christ. And uh, the, you know, the boy gets up from the table. I will not eat. What are you going to do? Are you going to please that boy? Are you going to please that girl? Here is a consecration that no matter who, no matter what, will love Christ more than them. That means you take your stand. You know, your, your son, your daughter wants to go to the nightclub. Wants to go and waste her life there. In the past, you say, okay, you can go, but come back before midnight. And the girl goes and does not come back till 5 a.m. in the morning. She rings the bell. And you, you fear that your daughter, you're the one to stand up and wipe sleep away from your face and go and open the door. I told you to come at 12 midnight, finish. Your my skills. The dance was too sweet. Okay. Now you are born again. <laughs> and daughter said, Papa, I want to go to the nightclub. No more. You will not go anymore. I am born again. You'll be born again. And the child becomes angry and he beats this and he smashes at everything on the ground. Where I stand, I stand. You will not go to that nightclub. This is a consecration that will love righteousness above unrighteousness. And whatever son or daughter will have our um, confidence, consent, he must follow this way. My brothers and sisters, that is consecration. But the person that falls for everything, the person that yields to everybody, and does not have a stand. He does not have conviction. He does not have consecration. And he doesn't possess sanctification. I'm coming to point number three there. Is the confirmation of our godliness and sanctification. In Second Peter chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 3. According as his divine power. He has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and to virtue. And then in verse 4. It says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. He gives us virtue and godliness. He gives us the experience of sanctification. And we have the divine nature. The divine nature is not only good outwardly, it's also good inwardly. 
the divine nature is constant. And with that divine nature, we have holiness in the heart and holiness in the exterior, external life. We're coming to point number three. Point number three, we're looking at the comprehension and the possession of the gifts of the Spirit. He gives us the gifts of the Spirit. There is grace by the Spirit. There are the gifts of the Spirit. And it's with that we do the work of God. Look at three things here. Number one, we're praying passionately for the gift of the Spirit. Number two, pursuing perseveringly for the gifts of the Spirit. Number three is preaching persuasively to Gentiles by the Spirit. The gift of the Spirit, number one. The gifts, plural, number two. Number three, we're preaching to Gentiles. By the gifts of the Spirit, number one. Praying passionately for the gift singular of the Spirit. We're looking at Acts chapter 2. Reading from verse 38. It says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you. And he says, In the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Gift of the Holy Ghost. Singular, that means be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. Be enveloped in the Holy Ghost. Be immersed in the Holy Ghost. After we are saved, there's still something more. After we are sanctified, there is still something more. Uh, look at the tree. Look at the branches. And look at the fruit on the tree. Salvation cuts off the branches of the tree. Sanctification removes the root of that tree. And makes the inner heart holy. Now, the spirit is to come and live in the heart. And he is the Holy Spirit. He doesn't accept, he doesn't live in a heart that is unholy. Unrighteous. Unclean. And so, you want the gift of the spirit. The person of the spirit. The third personality in the Godhead. You want the Holy Ghost to live on the inside of you. You are saved. You have cleaned, you have swept the outside of the house. You have washed, you have scrubbed all the pavement outside the house. And you are expecting a dignified man. When that dignified man comes, it's not going to sit on the pavement at outside. It's going to come into the house. As you sweep the outside, you must clean up the inside as well. Salvation outside the heart is clean. Sanctification 
holiness of heart, the inside is washed, is cleansed, is made holy. And now, because the heart is holy, sanctified, you now invite the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, to come and live on the inside. You don't uh, expect the Holy Spirit to come and live in the midst of fields and defilements and dirt. That's why he makes you holy. In readiness for the entrance, in readiness for the residence of the Holy Spirit. And you pray passionately for the gift, the baptism in the Spirit. Look at number two. Number two, you pursue perseveringly the gifts in the plural of the Spirit. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're reading from verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with us. Salvation is profitable for me, for the individual. Sanctification is profitable for me, the individual, so you can get to heaven. The gifts of the Spirit make you profitable to the field, to the people, to the multitude, so that you can do the work of God with power, with productivity. The manifestation of the Spirit, manifestation, bringing out and doing the work is giving to every man to profit with her. Look at verse 8. It says, for to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. To another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. These are the gifts of the Spirit. That a preacher, that a prophet, that a, a person serving the Lord, that he manifests, that will make him profitable to the audience. Verse 9. In verse 9, to another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. In verse 10, it says to another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. Diverse, different kinds of tongues. If it's only one kind, the one you spoke 35 years ago, and you repeat that and repeat that, that is not the gift of the Spirit. This one, diverse, different kinds of tongues. And then it says to another interpretation of tongues. If that tongue cannot have interpretation, because it's no language, it's like what gibberish the baby is trying to bring forth. And that baby at 10, at 20, at 30, at 35, that same thing uh, that the baby, unintelligible thing the baby was saying, uh, is still coming out at 35, uh, and there's no interpretation for it. That's not what this is talking about. Baby, 
the Lord will give you the gifts of the Spirit. The word of knowledge. The word of wisdom. The discerning of spirits. The gift of faith. The gifts of healing. The gifts of walking miracle. And the prophecy. And the diverse kinds of tongues. And the interpretation. And when what you say is interpreted, it will convert souls. It will turn lives around. And you yourself, speaking different kinds of tongues, there will be diff different levels of love, of charity, of power, of penetration, of productivity. Be it confirmed in your life in Jesus' name. Number three now is preaching persuasively to Gentiles by the Spirit. Somebody is preaching, but nobody is persuaded. He just had a nice time. There is no point that he made in our lives. And there is uh, no evidence that he even is logical enough for us to understand him. He just carries the Bible. And then he opens the Bible. He reads something there. And he cannot interpret that thing and persuade us that this is what God is saying. You give him a topic. And he carries that topic. He announces the topic. And then he begins to talk. Nobody is persuaded that this preacher even understands the topic he was given. Nobody will come to conversion. But when uh, the Spirit of God has called you, He has commissioned you, and you are consecrated to that commission, and you study, and you search, and you pray, and you have the conviction yourself, and you are at it. And now you proclaim persuasively to the Gentiles by the Spirit of God. That is ministry. And from today, that ministry will be yours. You will preach persuasively. In first, in Second Corinthians chapter five, reading from verse eleven. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. Knowing the judgment of the Lord. Knowing what will happen to the unrepentant in the future. We persuade men. We go to the village, we persuade men. We persuade them to turn unto the Lord. We come to the city. We persuade men to turn unto the Lord. We are preaching to workers in the vineyard. We persuade them that this way you are doing the work will never convert anybody. We persuade them. That the way you are even living and the carelessness in your life, God cannot use you to turn sinners to salvation. We persuade men, men who are ministers. We have chance to talk to them. We say you are a minister. What life has been changed, transformed by your ministry? Your converts, where are they? Look at that one, your converts. Still drinking, still fighting, still stealing. And you are telling them you are saved, you are saved. What persuasion do you have over those people under your leadership? 
conversion a su sur ces gens qui sont sous ton leadership. You are like them, they are like you. You are going around together, nightclub, and dancing, and all that, preacher, and the people who are hearing. Et vous faites les mêmes choses, aller en boîte de nuit, boire, danser, faire tout prédicateur et ceux qui l'écoutent. You say, the Lord is coming, the Lord is coming. Are you persuading anybody? After preaching, the Lord is coming. And without holiness, no man shall say, the Lord, you are still living like you lived last year. That's why, friends, brothers and sisters, preachers, pastors, teachers, will want to now have a persuasive ministry. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God. We are made manifest unto God. God follows us everywhere. When we go to preach there, preach there, he follows us everywhere. If he looks at our preaching, and touch, the preaching touches no life, the preaching leads nobody to repentance. The preaching prepares nobody for heaven. We are made manifest unto God. And God shakes his head. This man will say, he's serving me. And Christ shakes his head. This man will say, he's preaching Christ. And yet, he does not turn them from darkness to light. He does not turn them from the power of Satan unto God. Is God shaking his head concerning you? Why don't you turn around this morning and say, now I will serve the Lord. Your preaching, your teaching will turn people away from sin and turn them to salvation. And now you are made manifest unto God. Instead of shaking his head, he nods his head. He said, that's good. He said, that's right. He said, that's what I want. And they that turn many unto righteousness shall shine forever and ever. And we are made manifest in your conscience. When people listen to you, you are made manifest in their conscience. They know if you are trying to please them. They know if you are only trying to befriend them. They know if you want the offering to be big, that's why you are saying what you are saying. But if you are persuading them to follow the Lord, you are made manifest in their conscience. That they know this man wants me converted. He wants me saved. He wants me to get to heaven. I may not appreciate all the vocabulary and all the grammar, but I appreciate the fact he has a sincere heart. He wants me to get to heaven. Made manifest in their conscience. The Lord has spoken to us. We're going to pray. The prayer of number one by you. Number two, the prayer will be led by our coordinating overseer in Central Africa. Number three, I myself have come back to pray for you. Prayer and a threefold cord will not be broken. Your prayer, he pray with you, and me praying all together at the end. Something must happen today. Something must happen today. 
Now, now, the word push. Push. En anglais. If you're right, push. You pray until something happens. That's the prayer they prayed in Acts chapter 4. Push. Everybody shout, push. Pray until something happens. Something must happen this morning. Rise up and push. Rise up and push. Rise up and push. Pray until something happens. This is a great day. The Lord has revealed his mind to us. Therefore, pray. Threefold cord cannot be broken. You have heard the word is very, very clear. And therefore, you want to pray for yourself. The husband man that laboreth must first be partaker of the fruit. Greater growth through grace and gifts of the Spirit. God wants us to grow. To grow. And greater growth. And greatest growth. In order to please God, in order to make God not deserve and say, Yes, this my servant is doing my will. And it will take the grace of God, it will take the gifts of God. Therefore, pray now. I say, Lord, I bring myself before you. I know you want to use me, walk in my life. Transform my life. Pour your grace into my soul. Change me first and foremost. And use me as a change instrument. Through the gospel. To bring many converts into the kingdom. No matter what has happened in your life before. You can begin afresh. No matter how you have been living your life before. You can start anew. Don't write yourself off. Don't write yourself off. Don't say that no hope for me. There's hope for you. If you have not been living right, it's a matter of confessing to God and saying, Lord, have mercy on me. I have not been pleasing you. I have not been doing your will. I have been preaching to others and not preaching to myself. Lord, I've heard your word today. Touch my life. Save me. Let the gospel first and foremost avail for my soul. When they prayed, the grace of God was upon their life. That's what we read in that Acts 4 verse 33. And great grace was upon them. And they were able to do greater works for the Lord. That great grace can come upon you and save you and sanctify you and transform you and empower you and enable you and equip you for greater works. You can see the passion of our Father concerning us that we be what God wants us to be. You see his passion for Cameroon, that God will help us as ministers. He cannot be here permanently. 
It is you that God will use. You in your various churches. You in that fellowship. You in that region. You in that locality. You in that denomination. You can be a transformer. You can bring transformation. You can bring revival. When God has worked on you, when you leave this place and you go and you begin to preach this gospel persuasively and the people will say, something has come upon our pastor. Something has come upon our women leader. Something has come upon our Sunday school teacher. Something has come upon our unit leader. Something has come upon our choir master. And the spirit and the grace will flow through you into their lives. And there will be transformation. Pray now. Pray now. In Jesus' name we pray. Give me a good amen. We heard that we have a commission and purpose of the gospel of the Savior. We are not just gathering in church, church, church. Collect money, collect offering. And live large as a pastor, as a minister. We have a commission. And as a purpose. And what is it? Preach the gospel. Save souls. Number one, I want you to look into your life. That gospel must first impact your life. You must first be a receiver of that gospel. You must first be transformed by that gospel. The powerful gospel. Pray now and say, Lord, if my life has not been transformed, like the Thessalonica brethren, like the people in Antioch, that they saw the grace of God in their life. Pray. If you have still been, uh, you know, condoning little, little sins, little, little carnality, little, little worldliness, little, little sins of the flesh, drunkenness, immorality, or whatever kind of sin, and you say no man can be free from sin, then why are you holding the gospel in your mouth? His name shall be called Jesus because he will save his people. He will save his people. He will save his people. Let it begin from you. Pastor, be saved. Woman leader, be saved. Evangelist, be saved. Unit leader, be saved. Choir master be saved. Whatever your area of work, be sure you are saved. You remember Saul of Tassos? He was a great leader in Judaism, but he was not saved. He was an injurious person. He was a persecutor. He was a wicked person. Until the day the Lord encountered him. He said, now, nah, the Lord has shown mercy on me. Who was in Jesus' person? Now I've received the grace of God. That I will be a pattern unto others whom I will preach to. Your life must be a pattern. If your life is not a pattern in godliness, in righteousness, in holiness, in commitment, consecration. Then you have no gospel to preach. You have no gospel to preach. Let the gospel, first of all, save you. Believe the gospel. Believe the gospel. Repent of any sin. Little or big. Thank God, God is merciful. God is merciful. Is not willing that any should perish. It's not enough to hear all this. Receive it. Let it change you. Confess your sins. Whatever sin they may be. 
No matter how long it has been with you, no matter how long you have been practicing it, call upon the Lord today and say, Lord, have mercy on me. He will forgive you. Just look up to him now. Just look up to him now. The Savior, he came to save. He will save you. He will save you. Bible says that he's able to save to the uttermost. That be certain sin, he will save you from it. That sin that runs in your family, in your generation, he will break that yoke in your life. And now you can say, I am free. Oh, glory to God, I am free. And then, and then, and only then, you can preach the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. The Lord has answered you in Jesus' name. Then we have a commission, a gospel to preach. As I said before, we're not just gathering, singing, dancing, and doing all the ceremony. We have multitudes to reach out and save them. And the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. If you preach that gospel, souls will be saved. If you believe that, say amen. But some of us tell stories. When I was there, when I was there, when I visited there, I went to UK, I went to America. That's not what God wants us to preach. Preach the gospel. I believe you have seen how our Father in the Lord preaches it at the crusade. Pure gospel, simple gospel, powerful gospel, life-changing gospel. Now tell the Lord, I will preach the gospel. I say I will preach the gospel. I say I will preach the gospel. Don't hide it from your people. When you go to your church, don't hide the gospel. That's the only way they can be saved. Reveal Jesus today. Show them Jesus. Show them Jesus from the word of God. Show them the Savior. Preach the Savior. Paul said we preach Christ crucified. Preach the crucified Christ. He has power to save. He will save the sinners in your community. Reach out in crusades. Reach out in special programs. Throw the gospel net to all the people around. Even the people in the church. Don't just be interested in ceremonies. Go and preach the word. Preach the word. Be instant in season. In in season and out of season. Preach it. You have heard it. When you feel unhappy, preach the word. When you are happy, preach the word. When you are persecuted, preach the word. When you are sorrowful, preach the word. The glorious gospel. The fullness of the glorious gospel. Paul said, I am sure when I come, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. And if you have been preaching it before, oh, there is a greater going forth. There is a greater going forth. God has been giving you open door. There is a greater open door. As you go there, as you go back now, look for the greater open door. Paul said, a great and effectual door is opened unto me. Even though there are many adversaries, don't mind about the adversaries. The Lord says, Lord, I am with you. If you are preaching the gospel, if you are doing what he said you will do, if you are preaching to save sinners, the Lord will be with you. The Lord will confirm the word with signs for the earth. The wicked people, they will be silenced. Satan's agents will be silenced. 
and saints and, and sinners will be saved. And you'll be surprised. Greater things will happen in your ministry. Greater conversions will happen in your ministry. Ask it, ask it, ask it from God. God, I want greater conversions. And therefore, I will go forth in a greater way. Evangelism, evangelism, evangelism. After salvation, after holiness, evangelism. Mobilize all your members. In deeper life. Outside deeper life. Everywhere. Let the people know there is one goal. There is one way. There is one mission. Preach the gospel. And the Lord will back you up. In Jesus' name we pray. Consecration of partakers of the grace of sanctification. Listen to me. Ah, it's wonderful. That God wants us to be like him. He says, as obedient children, as obedient children, be ye holy as I am holy. Are you not happy that God wants you to be like him? If you're happy, say amen. That's what he did in the beginning. Let us make man in his own image. After our likeness. And God will do it for you in Jesus' name. God has commanded that we must be sanctified. We read it in that Leviticus 27 and 8. <laughs> be ye holy for I am holy. And so you are going to ask the Lord. I will obey this command. I, co I consecrate my life. I surrender myself. My spirit, my soul, my body. Look at yourself. As a vessel unto God. And say, God, sanctify me. Do your own part now. Consecrate yourself now. Surrender yourself now. Yield yourself now. Your spirit, your soul, your body. Let it be totally yielded to God. Oh, let God possess you. Let God possess you. Flee from every appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. Brother, God can do it. God can sanctify you. He will circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed to love him with all your heart, all your soul. Be ye holy, for I am holy. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall say the Lord. Say, Lord, here am I. Without holiness, no heaven. Without holiness, no heaven. Without holiness, no heaven. Imagine all the preaching you have preached. Imagine all the commitment you have made. Imagine all the sacrifice you have made. Imagine all the places you have gone up and down. And yet, you don't make heaven. Consecrate yourself. Surrender yourself. The Lord will confirm it in your life. The Lord will purge you. The Lord will purify you. The Lord will make you holy. And from today, oh, your life will be glorious. You have the nature of God. You have the life of God. You have the purity of God. You have the righteousness of God. You will serve him without fear. In holiness. In holiness and righteousness. Before him. All the days of your life. A holy person is a happy person. He will do it for you. He will do it for every one of us. As you pray, believe. As you pray, believe. Isaiah prayed, and God touched him. He sent a coal of fire and touched his heart. And he said, your sin is taken away. 
the sin, S I L, the inbred sin, the sin in the inward. God is taking it away. In Jesus' name, we pray. If you believe something is happening in you, shout Amen. The comprehension and possession of the grace and gifts of the Spirit. The gifts of God. They are free for you. As you are saved, as you are sanctified, the gifts will come upon you. They prayed on the upper room. And the Bible says, suddenly, there was a rushing mighty way. And a fire rested upon them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. If you believe, say amen. Pray and say, oh Lord, do it for me now. Do it again. If you have got it before, you can get it again. You can be renewed again. You can be refreshed again. You can be reinduced again. You can be rebaptized re re again. You can be empowered again. Pray. You need the Holy Ghost. You need the gift of the Spirit. You need the gift, the Holy Ghost himself. The personality of the Holy Ghost. You need it. And then the gifts will come. And then the gifts will come. And then the gifts will come. Yes, all the nine gifts can come upon you. Pray. 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 Something is happening this morning. Something is happening this morning. It's coming upon you. As our Father in the Lord will come and seal it up. Power. Power. Anointing. The gifts of God will rest upon you. Your ministry will change. Your ministry will not be the same again. And you will go and you preach persuasively. You preach persuasively. You preach passionately. You preach with all your heart. You preach like a dying man to a dying generation. Oh, you are receiving now. You are receiving now. You are receiving now. I can feel him now. I can feel him now. I can feel him now. Can you feel him now? I can feel him now. He's descending on you. He's descending on you. He's descending on you. He's descending on you. Pray. Amen. Heaven has said amen to your prayer. Everything you have asked, the Lord has given you. You will not be like before. New anointing upon your life. A new baptism in your life. New courage and confidence. New deliverance and dominion. New elevation. Yeah. What is the person I'm talking yeah. about? Yeah. Elevation. Yeah. Lift up that hand. Yeah. As I, as you are going to be elevated. Yeah. A new fellowship with God. Yeah. New fire and fervency. Yeah. A new level of grace. Yeah. And the gifts of the Spirit upon your life in Jesus' name. Yeah. Holiness. Yeah. Where are you? Yeah. Holiness. Yeah. Your name is now holiness. Yeah. Your nature, holiness. Yeah. Everywhere you go, yeah. your life will make people interested in holiness. Yeah. You are no more the same. Yeah. 
I said you. Me. Me. I'm telling you. It's me. I will no more be the same. I believe. I believe. Let me tell you now, don't repeat. I'm going to tell you what I believe. I believe <laughs> that here in Cameroon, one Kumuyi there, another William there, another defender of the faith there, the people who write stories in the world. Something will be written about you. Heaven has lifted you up. Anywhere you go, Satan will bow before you. Don't be afraid now. Go heal the sick. Don't be afraid. No demon can stand before you. Go cast out devils. The shadow of Peter healed the sick. Did you hear the testimony? Here at the crusade. That uh, somebody wanted to see me. So I could touch him or her. And there was no chance. So she said, look at the place where the tire of the car of the pastor went. And he went and stood on the mark of the tire. She said, I got it. And he got it. Your shadow, your torch, everything, your clothes, the handkerchief that goes out from you, new anointing, baptism, and power. And you yourself, carrying healing to other people, that healing will be every part of your body you touching other people and they're getting healed your wife just by touching her you're not even praying my wife how are you and you touch her every sickness will leave her body a new day has begun in Cameroon Raise up your hand for that new anointing. Father, in Jesus' name. A new day has begun. A new release of power. A new release of unction. Lord, I pray. Power from heaven. Fire from heaven. Authority from heaven. Anointing from heaven. Come upon every one of your people in Jesus' name. Every minister here, a ministering anointed pastor in Jesus' name. Anointing follow you everywhere. Power follow you everywhere. And Lord, I pray, exploits, great exploits, good exploits, unique exploits, through every brother, every sister, in Jesus' name. Your people will go forth, they will not be tired. They will preach, you will confirm their preaching. They will pray, heaven will say yes to their prayer. 
Those who have never laid hands on the sick, those who have never gotten anybody healed, those who have never gotten anybody delivered this day, that new ministry has started in your life. Nothing will hinder you. Nothing will drive you back. That unstoppable spirit enter into you right now. Say, I am unstoppable. Say, I am unconquerable. Say, I am unbeatable. Come up and never go down. Come deeper and never go shallow. Mount up. Mount up. Above your mountain. Mount up. Above the ocean. Mount up. Above the stormy sea. Mount up. Above tradition. Mount up. Above your past weakness. Go and preach. Go and heal. Go and set captives free. Go in the joy of the Lord. Everything bringing sadness in your heart, the Lord has wiped away. Your family will experience the outpouring of the power of God. Amen. Nothing will stop you. Amen. Nothing will conquer you. Amen. Nothing will beat you. Amen. Like me, you are. Like Christ, we will all be. Confirmation in your life. My brother, confirmation in your life. My sister, my daughter, confirmation in your life. You will go places you have never gone. You will do things you have never done. You will prophesy that you have never prophesied. The gifts of the Spirit enter into you right now. Succeed. The Lord is talking to you. Succeed. Yeah. Heaven is talking to you. Succeed. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.